Hi, I'm Stefano Domenicali, and this is uh, Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. A very warm welcome to Formula One's boss. Stefano, thanks for being on the program. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks, to, to, thanks to you, and uh, great to connect back again. Uh, yes. For both of us with different hats. Yeah, both of us with different, hat, different hats. It's been a while. I saw you three years ago in Barcelona. You were leaving a conference room as the head of Lamborghini. And um, life has certainly changed a little bit. Uh, where are you today? Well, actually, this is true, Jason. Actually, today I'm in our head office in central London. And of course, not anymore a CEO of Lamborghini, but uh, let's say being responsible for an incredible project that has been part of my life since uh, the early stage of my life, I would say. For sure, since uh, I was uh, a boy, uh, in Imola at college, and then, of course, after university in Ferrari. So a long journey back. You, you were a boy who went to the Autodroma Enzo e Dino Ferrari uh, weekends to help out in the paddock in the media center, and now you're running the whole thing. I mean, it has to be a dream come true. Well, in a way, true. Uh, it's absolutely like that. And, and uh, I always said that to myself, uh, uh, you know, if that dream can true for me, it can come through for a lot of people. And, and I'm uh, really say that with the, with the proud of uh, having achieved this incredible achievement in opposition, starting from a normal basis. And therefore, in this moment where uh, a lot of uh, people are uh, trying to fight for a dream, I really want to, sh to share that uh, with everyone, with my experience. This is real. This is something that happened to me. It can happen to anyone. The, the only thing that I'm just saying, uh, go for it, uh, never give up, work hard, uh, be respectful, uh, making sure that you always listen, learn, and improve yourself. Uh, don't, don't worry about the defeats that can happen in your life, but really be strong. And then, of course, with a bit of luck, you can do it. You were born the son of a banker. Was your father into racing? Well, actually not. Uh, not at all. <laughs> uh, and actually, he took me to basketball. Because he was uh, he was in love with basketball, and I'm love basketball too, and but not in racing at all. So not in racing, but you became uh, you were in love with racing, and uh, and and in love with cars. You were you were a car lover at an early age, and loved Alfa Romeo. I think you had a Giulietta was your first car, right? So you were a car guy. Well, I cannot deny that because you know I spent all my life basically dealing with cars. And, and I love that side of it, but uh, I love motorsport uh, and has been my life in different role since the beginning. That is true. And uh, it's something that uh, only people that uh, do love cars can understand, maybe. But uh, really, this is uh, our life and this is our passion. So let's talk about the last 18 months or so since you've, since you've taken this role, since you, since you left the automaker role, and you went back to where you were previously. And of course, previously was as the head of Ferrari and Ferrari racing. Um, tell me what it's been like to be back over this course of the last 18 months. Well, first of all, uh, I have to say thanks so much for the trust that uh, Chase Carey and Greg Maffei gave to me because uh, I received an unexpected call when I was really in a good position, I have to say both from a personal point of view and also from the of professional point of view. But, uh, you know, there are trains that are passing uh, through the station once in a life. And I thought, that, well, that's an, op an opportunity that I cannot miss. Uh, I was really honored by the call and I took that immediately as a, an incredible sign of uh, something that, uh, consider my previous experience in Ferrari, I left the world of F1 in a, in a difficult moment. Uh, I, I cannot deny that. In 2014, uh, when Ferrari started the new hybrid uh, season, we didn't have a, a great car. And I thought it was the right decision, you know, to take the responsibility of it and uh, and, and and making sure that the, 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 the team would have a different boost in a moment where the, a lot of political things were not really heading in the right direction. And, and therefore... Uh, Join back Formula One at, at this moment in uh, this new position. Well, it's something that uh, is uh, really incredible. Uh, 18 months seems uh, started yesterday hmm. uh, because the intensity of the job, the, 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 the beauty of this job uh, and the ent enthusiasm that you have to have if you have to do this job is incredible. Uh, there are so many challenges there, but there are so many opportunities uh, that uh, really 
I cannot believe that, uh, as you said, Jason, 18 months had just passed away. Different challenges uh, and, a dr- and a demanding schedule. I think you've just spent the last seven days on three different continents. Am I correct? <laughs> you are following us very, very well. Yes, it's true. I mean, we were in Baku. Then I went to, to South Africa for a meeting. Then I passed through for one day back in Paris for some meetings. Then I went to Montreal and then Sunday night back to, to London. Well, if you do this job, you cannot be really, you know, a guy that likes to have the, the flip-flop and, and stay <laughs> around the bedroom or, or around TV. That's part of the intensity that everyone that is, is involved in this, in this business needs to have. Let's go back to the the phone call where you were asked to do this. Um, you just said you didn't see it coming. Um, what were your expectations going in? I mean, once you realized the opportunity. Well, the expectation, uh, I have to say, is where the ones that I knew, because knowing that world uh, from a different perspective since a long time, I, uh, I came in into a, a difficult moment uh, considered COVID. And, and uh, you know, when you go into a new business, uh, not having the chance to, to meet the people of your organization uh, physically is not easy. I remember the first uh, months uh, before the start of the season of last year with the challenge of COVID, uh, not having the chance to meet our people and just see as we are looking at each other now on the video is not easy, I, I guarantee to you. Uh, therefore, that was really the challenge at the beginning. Uh, I knew more or less, you know, the different dimension of the business. I, I was not, for, of course, uh, up to speed on all the uh, different elements. But, of course, uh, that was very important because what I said at the beginning, you know, having that uh, to, business, to manage the business in such a difficult condition, it was important to, to know everything, uh, you know, from my past experience. How did you do that? I mean, how, how do you meet your your colleagues, your constituents, and build trust and build confidence in new leadership when, as you said, you couldn't even see anybody or, or, or you saw them in a very limited way? Well, that, that was really the challenge. Uh, the, the only thing we can do it is spending time on the video, spending time of, uh, uh, from one side, knowing our internal organization. And when you come into an organization, you need to make sure that you're humble to understand that the different uh, people, the, 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 the logic of the organization and trying to be respectful of what has happened and then try to give your input as soon as you have understood exactly everything before doing some mistake. Then on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, get in touch with all the stakeholders, you know, all the team uh, principal, all the drivers, all the sponsor, all the media partners, all the promoters. You know, that's uh, something that uh, requires time, requires dedication. And then now, thanks God, we can do it physically back again it's a different story, but uh, you know, we need to re- we had to react to that situation, and I have to say that Form One was very very good in reacting to that. We were the only international championship that was able to deliver two championship in a row, going all around the world with all different regulation, with different protocols. Uh, it's not given for granted the, the success of it, and I have to say it was great to see all the partners so involved in order to make sure that we were able to deliver the championship. And we have to re- uh, thank everyone because without the help of everyone, we were not able to, 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 to deliver that. And now we see the results because at the end of the day, you know, we are going back with the people. Uh, we have, Form 1 is even an incredible success. There's no doubt, you can see the, sig- the signal of uh, the full crowd that we live everywhere we go. The, the interest and the numbers that we are seeing today on the media, on TV, on, on network, on social media, on radio, on podcast. I mean, it, it's massive. We have a new, new, new way of, of a new, new, sorry, new fans, uh, more female getting into the business, younger audience, uh, new continents uh, really approaching Formula One. So that's a state of health that is uh, incredibly strong now. It's incredibly strong. And two years ago, Stefano, just prior to you taking the job, there were some who were really writing Formula One off as as uh, as a failure, that it was boring, that it didn't have any interesting um, uh, drivers, that uh, that most races were very predictable. And two years later, now everything's changed. It's yeah. remarkable. I think it's remarkable, and I think that we need to give the credit to to, to Chase Carey. Uh, to Ross Brown, to Greg, of course, as a vision uh, to make that happen. 
And at that moment, I think that the strategy of liberty was the right one. There was the need of a, of a discontinuity to make sure that the, the, we were able to create the right foundation for a better future. And now we are, we are building a business that is strong because there is uh, attention to all the different uh, elements of the business. If you think that uh, on the sporting side, we were pushing through, of course, the FIA uh, to have different cars with a different regulation to enable the drivers who are represent our jewels, basically, to fight closer. And now you see that mission has been accomplished because the cars are really able to stay close together. They can offer great show, uh, great fights on the track, I have to say, up to now. And that was one point that was really relevant to bring back the passion on the track, uh, to keep the enthusiasm there. Second point, budget cap. Budget cap was an incredible success because we were able uh, since, uh, well, the life of Formula One, to cap the technical expenditure in order to basically try to make sure that in, in the shorter term as possible, all the teams can really compete uh, uh, very closely. And we see that uh, that is happening. Of course, the magnitude between the first and the second is still in certain places a little bit higher, but we are definitely sure that this, this gap will be shortened up in a, in a, in a quicker time. And, and by giving that, we gave the sustainability to the teams in terms of financials. Uh, because if you connect to the control of the cost with the high revenue that we're bringing in, directly and undirectly, I mean, that gives uh, the, 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 the landscape we are giving, that we are living today. And if you look on the other things, partnership and sponsorship, you never saw so many incredible brands of all the different categories in, investing in Formula One with us and also with the teams. So that means that financially, the teams can look ahead in a different position, a stronger position. Then if you look at the way that we have, a, we were able to connect with different narratives, with different categories, with different languages, with the different audiences, and, and uh, open up the way to talk about for one with different way. I mean, that was another way to, to, to say that uh, successfully, we are very inclusive. And, and now the demand of uh, talking about Formula One is not only through the avid fans, is also with people that uh, get in touch with us since uh, a short time, and they're really interested with on, on certain subjects that maybe are not so technical, but in any case, they're talking about Formula One. And then there are promoters. Promoters means uh, uh, countries or, or government that really through Formula One wants to develop the platform. And we see that today, you know, we never been in such a situation where we need to really decide where to go because the request is so big that we really need to, you know, decide where to go. But that's, it's a great opportunity because, you know, we are pushing the right way in order to promote better the sport. And this is something that uh, uh, will, will happen and, 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 and will give the chance to also the, let's say, with all respect, old fashioned promoters, to, to wake up and making sure that they do the better business. Otherwise, you know, in this context, you know, the, the, the worst will be left behind. And if I can say, cutting across transversally, we can really apply our new values to the systems because uh, we are very strong in our sustainability program that will involve all the teams, all the stakeholders, all the manufacturers, all the promoters. We are really pushing in order to make sure that, uh, you know, the community, in terms of diversity, in terms of helping, you know, the, the less uh, lucky community can be part of our program. So there are so many things that are important, uh, and I would say are the key of the success we are living today. Well, and Formula One for years, for decades, was exclusive, not inclusive. And then a little show came around that pulled the the ro open open the curtains and pulled the ropes back, and it it's called Drive to Survive. And it gave a global audience the opportunity to look behind the scenes, to see some of the stories, to, to realize the personalities, to talk about the, the, um, the struggling teams who were trying to make it, to talk about the successful teams who were, trying to, who were fighting each other. And all of a sudden now, boom, the world knew more about Formula One, its drivers, and the demographic, to your point, Stefano, changed completely. You had 20-something women who wanted to know when the next race was going to be held. I mean, this is the one phenomenon that you did not mention that I think has had an enormous impact, especially in America. You agree? 100%. I totally agree. And, and I think that uh, I would have mentioned before in the way that we were able to cut the different narratives 
to different audience. That was the point. And that's mm -hmm. just, it helped tremendously with no doubt about it. And as always, there are uh, fathers of this project that belongs to Liberty. It was Sean Bratches that within Chase Carey pushed that project along. And uh, at the beginning, we had some teams that were not uh, really happy to be involved in that. Now it's the other way around because they understand, they understand, they have understood the power of, of being able to get closer to a different community of, 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 of fans. And, and that is true. We see that the magnitude of that is, is immense. Uh, you, you're right. I mean, you asked that open up the way to see what is behind the scene. We have a problem, if I may say, that is uh, our jewels or our heroes wear helmets, gloves, overall. They are in a car with a halo that is difficult to see even the eyes. And therefore, it was important to uh, make sure that the people understood that behind that, there are boys so far, but will be also girls in the community already now, but even soon, hopefully, with the driving on the, on the driving overall, that are living a, an incredible life. And so it's really important to show what is really behind the scene, as you said. Therefore, I think that's the right way to make sure that we, we, we explain who we are and what is behind our, let's say, our, our official face that sometimes for someone can be seen as a mask. It is not. But also, of course, behind you, you are discovering that there are thousands of people working to make sure that show uh, in form of Formula One to be successful and great. Yeah, we had Sean as a guest on this show, and he talked about the, the the change in philosophy that occurred and the fact that drivers could have a lot more independence and they could have social media accounts and they could they could really be out there from a marketing standpoint. And clearly um, the the accelerator has been pushed on that on that aspect of it. There is such a close connection now, uh, the following, the allegiance to certain drivers globally. Um, you're a Lewis guy or you're a Max guy or you're a Daniel guy. I mean, that, that has to be, as a marketer, that, that, that almost has to be the epitome of exactly what you want. Um, you know, the NFL has been successful at that. Other leagues, other big leagues have done the same. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, and, and I have to say, on that respect, the American market is, is teaching us a lot of things. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, American leagues or American sport uh, have different philosophy. Uh, but at the end of the day, there has to be the attention to the human being, to the sport itself. And, 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 and you need to learn from that in order to develop that and also in other places, in other countries, where maybe the culture is, uh, is, uh, is following another direction. And this is another opportunity to develop also worldwide. And I think that is really the intention that we want to take. And therefore, that experience has been massively important for us in order to understand that there is a huge potential that through that uh, has enabled us to get in touch with a lot of different people and a lot of different partners. It's entertainment, right? We have to remember at the end of the day, this, you know, sport is, is entertainment. Sport is the biggest thing, I would say, we can see from one as the most incredible entertainment of the motorsport dimension. Yeah. It's, it's a place where uh, we have uh, not only the technological the technical challenge, the sporting challenge, but we need to run a show. We're in to run something where mm. people need to have excitement. If you take away that passion in terms of dimension, forget it. It's a research and development. It's not anymore motorsport. <laughs> that makes a difference. You know, if a research and development, of course, uh, you, you, you can be also very happy to do that, but it's not really what we are doing. It's part of the equation. Uh, of course, on, on on that respect. But you know, uh, if you take away the, the the emotion that the motorsport is giving, is entertainment. And therefore, we need to focus, and we, this is what we are doing today. I mean, the the, the, the events that we are <clears throat> organizing together with our promoters, it's for sure Formula One. It's for sure Formula Three and Formula th and Formula Two that we belong to our pyramid of the growth of of uh, of arriving in Formula One. But there is uh, events organize at the track where there will be music, there will be entertainment, there will be a fun zone when you can really be a live experience that has to be unique for all, everyone that is attending to come back again. Somebody told me that the Miami Grand Prix um, this spring was a, uh, was a party that happened to have a uh, race involved uh, with it as a, as a side event. <laughs> is, that, is that accurate? 
It, I would say <laughs> Miami was insane. If to use the right word, in, uh, I think with the American uh, with American uh, meaning, insane in terms of uh, gigantic. Everyone wanted to be there. That's the place to be. That was the the, the, the statement that everyone was saying that, that in that respect. Uh, but the beauty of that was an event that uh, was not only the track around the Dolphin Stadium. It was an event uh, uh, that was uh, basically breathing was was around the city on Miami Beach, in all the restaurants, in all the places, in all the hotels, in the center uh, of the city, there was something connected to that race. And to receive from the American community that that event was bigger than Super Bowl, you can understand what that mean. Yeah. For us, it's an incredible achievement and accomplishment uh, that give us the dimension and the responsibility to, do, to, to, to make sure that the, the next one is even better, not only bigger, better. And that's really the way that we want to tackle the, the, not only the American market, but all the events that we are organizing so far. Success for Formula One has always been elusive. I'm sitting in downtown Detroit, and in 1982, I was on the streets of Detroit when the Formula One cars were uh, uh, racing around, and it lasted a few years, but then ultimately uh, faded out. I was also in Indianapolis when they tried at the speedway there and it didn't work. There's been other attempts at Watkins Glen. Why has Formula One not worked in the past? Well, uh, for I would say three main reasons in my opinion. The first, we were um, not consistent in our communication and, and, and content uh, throughout the year in US. So we were there for three years in, uh, in the year uh, for, the, for the event and then switch off. So the light was off. So no content, no explanation, no continuity, uh, no right partners, and no will to understand that was the, a must for us to, to grow. And on that, I think that uh, we are doing that, and, and we see the success. Second, of course, uh, the, 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 the need of being present with a sport that is uh, easy to understand and to explain. You know, we know that we say that with all respect, the American sports are quite uh, exclusive to that market. And, and to come in uh, is not easy. Therefore, there is the need of uh, explaining who we are, what we are bringing in, in terms of sport value, in terms of technological value, but also in terms of te entertainment level. And I think that we are doing that in the right way. Third, of course, investing with our, uh, with our partners in order to develop the sport, not only during the event, but also create festivals, create a moment of communication. And of course, I think that is, we cannot deny, Netflix gave the last boost together with, uh, with our media partner, ESPN, that did an incredible job to, 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 to take that responsibility in a period where you, 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 you are right. I mean, three years ago, we were in Austin uh, thinking, well, unfortunately, uh, with not great numbers and thinking, do we need to stay? Do we need to give up the American market? And now we have uh, hmm. this year Grand Prix. Next year, we're going to have a three Grand Prix. And the interest, the interest in the U.S. is booming. So this, I think, is the equation that is, is taking us for a great success we're living today. Has it even surprised you? Uh, a surprise in terms of speed of achievement of this uh, success, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not expecting to be so quick, but... Uh, it is what it is. And now we need to make sure that we take the advantage of it in order to manage this growth. Because as always, uh, when there is this opportunity, you need to make sure that this opportunity is taken seriously, consistently, and with the right resources in the right dimension. So we don't have to make any kind of mistake in this moment because the business that we can see growing there and the awareness and, and the love of 401 will, will, has to be managed in the proper way for the future. It's been said in the past that for Americans to become engaged in Formula One, that the series needed an American driver. Is that something with which you agree? I would say it's a, it's a relevant element, above all for the American culture. But uh, I always said that to be real, not fake. It's not just with the passport that you attract uh, the American fans. Because, uh, you know, if it's, if it's not good enough and not solid enough to be competitive, that is a boomerang because the disillusion will be bigger than, 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 than the illusion. Therefore, it's important to, to make sure that uh, there is uh, attention. And that's why I remember when I had a different cap uh, as being uh, responsible in the FAA of the single seater commission, we start to bring in, in America the F4 and the F3 to try to build up also the interest there. 
and 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 I hope that soon we're going to have the fruit of of this investment because that's very important. And uh, but it has to be real, as I said. Otherwise, it would be a problem. Let's talk about Las Vegas and the move to go there. Why was that appealing? Why why is why is Las Vegas the natural next step for you? I think Las Vegas, uh, in a way, is a place of glamour, is a place of excitement, is a place of entertainment. And, 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 and I think that just saying that, uh, it fits on what is Formula One. It, it has not been easy at the beginning, uh, because as you remember, we went there and, and having a race in the parking slot of Caesars to come back. But there was a, we were, and I was particularly stubborn, to make sure that the community understood the potential. And, and now I have to say, after uh, a difficult start uh, with the meetings with all the relevant stakeholders of, of, of Las Vegas, I see everyone understanding the potential and, and the community of Vegas is really very helpful. They understand that. We need to be careful in explaining who we are. We need to be careful in explaining what it doesn't mean in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of show, in terms of what we can bring in the community. But I think that... Uh, it's, it's something that we bring the, to the Vegas community, a, a broader international viewership, a broader international customers, a, a different clientele that will leave uh, the city for more than the, the event. And the fact that we have agreed to have the race on Saturday night is something very spectacular because we're going to race in the heart of, of the city, not in the parking slot. And the involvement of all the casinos, the hotel, resort, and so on, and also, uh, from a business point of view, from the community of Vegas, I think is a great achievement. Achievement in terms of having decided that we're going to do it. Now it's we are a hard working uh, in order to make sure that uh, all the things that we need to do, because we will be the promoter, you know, will be done in the proper in the proper way. You said you have to be careful to say who you are. What's the risk that you run into if you go into it without the proper steps that you've just alluded to? What's I the risk that, that you run? The risk that we don't have to run is uh, um, to be seen like a meteora, you see, like a, a falling star and then disappearing. We are going there with the, with the, with the, with the, with the wish and with the will to stay for a long time because we believe that is the right place to be. And, and, and this is something that we will do everything in order for the community to understand. And also from the business perspective, you can understand how many people we're going to bring in. And not only, how many people from the community of Las Vegas will work around this business that are uh, that is an important element to consider too in terms of other other markets you have been on the record saying that america africa and asia are important markets uh, going forward for formula 1 you arrived in south africa last week and there's a whole lot of talk about that race being added to the 2023 schedule anything more you can add well, I need to I need to say that uh, the, as we always said and stated, you know, we are a world championship, and the only continent so far that is not present is Africa, and therefore I think it's our duty to make sure that we can find the solution. Uh, that's our uh, hope. We are working with the government. We are working with the promoter. We are working with the circuit uh, management in order to make sure that this is happening. There are a lot of things to be done. Uh, of course, uh, the FIA has to approve and, and homologate the track that uh, so far is not on the standard, but I'm sure that, you know, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with that in, in, in place, that will be uh, done in the, in the due time. If we are able to achieve uh, all the things that we have discussed, of course, we will try to anticipate as much as we can that race in the calendar. I cannot say more than that, Jason, because, of course, uh, as I said, we are pushing very hard. Uh, there are, uh, of course, constraints that needs to be considered, but uh, I felt that the community there was really keen to go ahead uh, in the same way that we want. So let's stay tuned and let's see where uh, this would head to. A couple of other future topics, uh, if I may, Stefano. Uh, adding more teams, you've gone on the record to say that you're not interested in expanding the field tremendously. You kind of like where it is right now. Well, I, I think that the, the right point to say that we are not interested to enlarge the team because I do believe that so far the, the value of the championship is also the value of the business that the teams are doing with us. So the more teams we are having, the, 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 the less value we're going to give it to them and to us. And, and it's not a problem today in terms of competitiveness of the championship to have one more team or two more teams. 
It's more to, to see if the actual team are fighting each other in the right way. And of course, if uh, talking about new teams, we have uh, an incredible strong team that give value because of the brand, because of the manufacturer that could be involved. This is something that of course we will consider that accordingly and, and with the right uh, evaluation. This is what I want to say. So far, you know, if you, are, if you say to me, is this a problem for the competitive of the championship? I say no. You, you've said in the past that there are many manufacturers who are now, who have been awakened uh, thanks to the success of Formula One. And they can actually use Formula One as a technical benchmark, which of course we've seen through the years uh, applied at uh, various manufacturers. You have a lot of strong interest right now. A lot of talk of Porsche and Audi and how will the inclusion of other manufacturers, including possibly Porsche and Audi, affect the balance of power in Formula One? Well, I think that uh, what is important to say is that uh, eventually new manufacturers that are interested to come in uh, are coming in because uh, the value of the sport from both the awareness and the technological challenges are interesting. Otherwise, no way that in this moment where a manufacturer needs to invest the money in the way that, uh, in a way that has to be really very careful, uh, will be interested to us. That means that uh, on both sides, technological choices and, uh, and 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 sporting values and, and 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 media attention are very very strong. On the technical side, you know the, the fact that we have chosen to go and stay hybrid, being the first to be hybrid in this the world uh, uh, since 2014, and going to sustainable fuel. Is for sure a dimension will, which is attracting, you know, manufacture very, very significantly. Then we hope to 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 to, to say something on top of that uh, in the short term. I, I cannot say that as you can imagine, but the work is is very uh, big uh, to make sure that not only the brand that you say, uh, but also other could be interested in the future. And this is something that together with the FIA have the common interest to make sure that the platform is as inclusive as possible. And this is one point. The second point is, of course, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the, in this moment where there is a lot of attention on the mobility side, uh, on the electrification, we do believe that through our platform, we can really show that there is not only the full electrification that will be part of the portfolio of offer of the manufacturer, and I do believe that is a dimension where Formula One can be really the leader on that technological uh, development as it has been in other uh, area uh, on the technical side. And this is the reason why we, we, we feel that we can really play a great role for the future of, of the industry for, for in the next couple of years. And you still feel that F1 will be net zero carbon by 2030, correct? 100%, we have a big plan there. We're going to launch that very, very soon, uh, another, let's say, uh, update of our campaign, but we are totally committed to that. We know that is one point on which we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot miss because it's part of the points where the world and the partners that are working with us are really keen that this will happen, and we will do it. Uh, let's switch topics. Um, female drivers. You, you mentioned uh, the attraction now of a female demographic in terms of viewership and audience, but will there be a female driver in the next decade? Uh, you said next decade, I really hope so. If you were asking me in the next three years, I would say, unfortunately not, because I'm, uh, normally I'm always, uh, I'm always the one that says the truth or what I think at least. Uh, the, 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 the inclusivity on, in our sport is passing through the fact that uh, men and women are uh, basically uh, fighting each other in the same championship. Uh, I think that uh, there is a, a lot of work that we want also to have a responsible uh, role to play to make sure that the awareness uh, uh, and the growth of the sport on the female level will, will have to start, but to a lower age. Because uh, the point that is, is very important, because there is a parameter, you know, we cannot have a, a business, uh, or sorry, a business, a championship that uh, will uh, see female running older than the, the threshold of 16 that is basically the, the threshold when we start in Formula 3. So there has to be a balance where the female world has to be pushed at a much younger uh, age in order to be attractive to fight on the same championship. So 
There is a lot of things to do, but I think that uh, you know we will want to play a very important role in this respect. We've had one guest on the show, a young woman, a Chinese Canadian woman named Samantha Tan, and who's making a lot of waves. Are you familiar with her? Yes, yes, we follow that. We follow mm. a lot, a lot, because we see that is a, a something on which we need to do something more, uh, and 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 maybe something better, because we see the potential of it. Do you foresee a day in the near future where Korean or Chinese companies will contest in Formula One? Uh, there is a chance, yes, uh, because I think that with our technical platform, they could be very, very interested. Uh, and also some Japanese can uh, may change their mind too. Hmm. Yeah, stay tuned. Outside of Formula One, Stefano, what major sports sanctioning body do you admire or do you seek to emulate? Well, uh, emulation is a word that I don't uh, really love because uh, uh, I'm, I believe that everyone has his own uh, uh, DNA, has his own uh, way of seeing the sport. But uh, my way of thinking is very simple. We can learn anything from anyone. So it's my duty to, 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 to be in the sport and business world and, 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 and understand how the other leagues or the other sports are, are managed. Because as I said, uh, we need to be humble. We, we, we cannot pretend to be the best, but uh, the aim is always to be the best in our dimension. Therefore, the only way to do it is to capture and to try to understand. We cannot, uh, we cannot be shy. If, if someone is doing something good, <laughs> it's great. So we can do it even better. But uh, the, my, my way of thinking is really uh, stay tuned in, in a record mode, try to, not, to understand every single thing from all of the different leagues of the sport in the world. Even if there are sports that it's difficult for me to understand, but, uh, but uh, that, that's my role and I have to do it. The NFL has actually risen to a place of superiority in America. Um, it's overtaken baseball. It's, uh, it is now the must-watch league that exists, but more success comes more scrutiny. And um, there are a lot of issues, obviously, uh, uh, within the National Football League that, that are exposed because more people are paying attention, quite frankly. How do you guard against something like that? I mean, to, to be transparent in our business, uh, making clear and stated very clear which are the rule of the games, the rule of engagement, full stop, is very simple. I had a good discussion with Roger Goodell uh, when I met him in the in, 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 in U.S., I had a very good relationship with with uh, with um, Adam Silver. I, I know the commissioner. I try to understand better the way that they manage the business, and it's, it's such an incredible respect from my side to them because they are manage a multi billion business, and uh, you know we are uh, in a way small, but we are getting bigger, uh, and, and therefore there is a lot to learn, uh, and 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 that's the way that, as I said before, I will do, and I will approach the sport in general. Uh, but uh, uh, as you said before, Jason, I mean, we are uh, in the entertainment business. So we have the privilege of having partners that are on the same world, that are uh, on the entertainment side. We can learn also from that. Therefore, there are a lot of uh, you know, things that we can really improve in the future. And that's why I'm so positive about our growth in the next couple of years. You made some improvements in the off season uh, following a very entertaining final race of the year last year. Did last year's final result help or hurt the sport? Well, I think that uh, uh, I give an answer that maybe is not conventional, but I would say highlighted that the sport is managed and run by human beings. Sure. Yeah. Therefore, with the good and the bad is, is a sport where the men or the women, not yet on the behind the steering wheel, but it will hopefully, as we said before, happen soon, at the end, is run by human beings. And that's yeah. the beauty of the world. Otherwise, we go with the with other way of, of, of uh, entertainment that, that doesn't belong to our sphere. Yeah, we had Danny Sullivan on the show, too, he, who has been a... Uh, a I know a him very, very, very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had a very interesting perspective on the end of it, but uh, on the end of last year. But but his his view was also, look, at the end of the day, it's exactly what you said. You, you, you have humans driving and you have humans making decisions in other places. But at the bottom line, Danny said his view was it just contributed the, to the great success of Formula One and to build on next year because it's a storyline, isn't it, Stefano? Yeah, I mean, we had 100 and, almost 110 million people watching <laughs> that race. 
life. <laughs> and imagine for Formula One, it's been a massive, massive, now incredible number. And 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 uh, to stay tuned up to the last lap uh, of the last race of the season reminds me some races where unfortunately me when I was in Ferrari, <laughs> I lost them. But that's the beauty <laughs> of the sport. I remember 2008 with Felipe when Ferrari we won the constructor title and Felipe was. Uh, when the Czech Republic champion, then Lewis won the first title for him. I remember 2010 with, with Fernando when we were uh, in Abu Dhabi. I remember 2012 with the, with the last rate of Vettel and Alonso, with Vettel having a spawn, having the primary source broken. He arrived at the end of the Czech flag and then he stopped. I mean, that's racing. That's the beauty of the intensity of our sport. You have a photographic memory for those results, Stefano. <laughs> well, I can tell you in sport, you have... Uh, and incredible uh, emotions that are uh, vibrating in, our, in your body when it's positive and have the privilege of living an incredible moment of positivity are exploding in a, in a, in a, in a super way where negative, and we're talking about sec being second, not being the last, are quite in, in invasive and it hurts physically. So I remember very, very well both of them. Speaking of those who finished first, uh, Lewis Hamilton has had a lot of praise for you. A lot of praise when you uh, were named into the uh, position that you have now. What can you say about Lewis's run at Formula One? Well, Lewis is an incredible, I would say, start from an incredible world champion that the numbers are, are speaking by themselves. But uh, then uh, he, he, his journey in Formula One uh, evolved in a different way. He took uh, uh, the responsibility of being a, a, a very important person that was pushing and he's still pushing very hard in certain values that uh, he believes uh, naturally very important, uh, not only for him, but also for the society, and, and for which I really do respect uh, a lot. And I would say we are working together with a lot of, 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 of points uh, in order to make sure that Formula One, you know, from the valorial point of view, is taking a step of responsibility. Therefore, I admire him for what he's doing in that respect. A couple more things here to close out. Um, I, I have to ask you, um, what do you think of the state of the auto industry these days? Let's let's go back to our former world here. We're, we'll come full circle on this uh, conversation. Well, um, I can I can speak and I have no, no shy to talk and, and tell my personal opinion that yes. has to be the personal, of course, to the role that I have. It's a moment of a transition. It's a moment of transition, but as always in life, transition makes a difference. And and uh, and uh, the the, the uh, automotive industry is living a, a, a moment where uh, it's so crucial that the, the political decision that uh, has taken or, or that has to be taken in the future are taking care of, the, of, of this industry uh, that is vital, that the, the relations between the political authorities and the automotive uh, manufacturer uh, has to be as solid as it never been in the past. I see today too many world of religion about electrification and about the, the, the fight against the internal combustion engine, but we need to be real. We need to manage the transition in the right way. To kill the automotive industry because we want to kill, you know, what is the normal line of progression of, of the transition means to kill a lot of uh, place to work, means to not to be real, and, 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 and also means not to be transparent with the people that are believing that certain things can happen from day to night. This is not real. And this is something that the automotive industry is paying the price with a lot of investment to make uh, uh, its role in a moment where sustainability for sure is important. But once again, we need to be and speak the real language without uh, saying something that is, doesn't belong to the truth. When we have to say that, uh, you know, the electrification is the, is the only way to go in the future tomorrow, we are saying something that in a theoretical world could be seen the truth, but practically is not. Therefore, we need to consider all the different dimension of that business. And therefore, as I say, it's a critical moment where automotive industry needs to play its game at the right level, but it needs to be strong on explaining the reason why the transition is the right time to, to, to be done in the proper way. You now, Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares, who I know you know very well, agrees with you wholeheartedly. I've talked to him through the years and he says, we have to be very, very careful with where things are going. Let, let's end on Formula One. Um, what does success look like for you one year from now? One year. 
Well, actually, one year uh, with my mind. Let's say a couple of years. <laughs> I would say, in, yeah, because I was saying, just in one year, I'm already mindset for the next year. So it's already. <laughs> so uh, in, I would say, in a couple of years, um, it's uh, really hoping that uh, the journey we, have, we started a um, couple of years ago will progress in the way that we are living today. Uh, I think that we are taking uh, all the different things. And the beauty of today is that we have a, a very strong relation with all the stakeholders. That means a lot. And, and I really hope that uh, what we have proven to be strong in a very difficult situation, things about COVID, things about uh, the effect of the world, unfortunately, and, and we have been always to be in the front line of the, of the growth will happen also in the future. So that's our commitment. That's our energy and that's our life. Therefore, we really hope that this will happen. And uh, let's make sure that we're going to stay tuned in the next couple of years to talk about it. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's really what uh, I would like to share with you. One final thing. When you launched the uh, uh, Lamborghini uh, Urus, it was, it was one of the most defining moments of your uh, Lamborghini career. And most people wouldn't know that um, as a car guy, on the day that you got married, you took your mother-in-law's Toyota to the church. Uh, those are two very different things, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm a normal guy. At that time, I had that car. My family had that car. So I said, listen, let's use that. I don't need to, to make a show off of my, of my wedding day. So, and unfortunately, there was some photographer that, that they saw me that coming in. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's our life. So that's well, okay. We'll find you in a Formula One car next. <laughs> Stefano, it has been an absolute pleasure to be reconnected with you. It's wonderful to have you on the program. Formula One is part of cars and culture, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thanks so much for your time. It's been always a pleasure, and looking forward to see you soon. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.